to Wednesday night service and thank you for tuning in. I hope that tonight is a special night for you. I really feel like I have a word that God uh, has given me. I'm not just saying that. I, I was praying and asking God uh, what to speak on and this subject came up to me uh, and it's, I'm going to be speaking about joy and it is a wonderful study. I think that you're going to uh, find that joy is our strength. Hallelujah. I'd like to make a few announcements, if I could, before we get into the Word of God. Um, we'd like to uh, let remind you that we're having a baptism service on April the 10th in our 11 o'clock service. And the Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And uh, so I hope that if you haven't been baptized, you'll consider getting baptized. And uh, if you have been baptized and you would like to rededicate your life, reconsecrate your life to the Lord, feel free to uh, get baptized again. I would encourage you also, if you're interested in men or women's softball, we are uh, still um, accepting sign-ups for the men and women's softball we also have the women's retreat that will be coming up. It's actually coming up this weekend. And you might say, well, my schedule has opened up so that I can uh, go. How about contact my wife and, um, and Jackie Sims and, and just say I'd like to be a part of the women's treat, retreat. Uh, they, they've got Karen Wheaton and uh, also Karen Abercrombie and a number of other special guests that are going to be there. This is going to be in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, they have a large crowd already signed up, a lot of the ladies from our church. I hope that you'll take advantage of that and be a part of that. Also, I want to remind you that our Easter drama, oh, it's been years now since we've been able to do our dramas. And and to God be the glory that things have opened up so as to be, for us to be able to do so. And our Easter drama, um, it will be on Friday the 15th and also on Sunday the 17th. Friday the 15th and Sunday the 17th. And uh, we're expecting a big crowd. The drama is going to be powerful I've been able to see bits and pieces of it as they've practiced, and it has been great. I hope that you will get the word out on that. Then on uh, April the 9th, um, Miss Becky Cromer with the Children's Department is having our Easter Family Day, and she's uh, got a big day planned. It's going to be so nice. In fact, uh, she, she's got a lot of bouncies and food and fun and games and it's just come out and just enjoy time watching children have a great time and that will be on the 9th uh, beginning at 11 a.m. So we're excited about all of that. Uh, things are happening. We want you to be involved. We want you to get ready to make great things happen in the year 2022. I believe, again, that this is a year of breakthroughs, and I hope that you'll find that God will give you a breakthrough for whatever your situation is in 2022. I also now would like to encourage you to give. Uh, it's our opportunity to be able to give. We welcome you and ask you if you're giving online, get your credit cards, your debit cards, your checkbook, however that you're preparing to give. You can give online, you can give through our church app, you can give uh, uh, through our uh, mail, or give it through the mail, I'll get it out in a minute. Uh, if you're here in person, you can give it in our offering boxes on Sunday morning, or you can drop your uh, tithe and offering by here at the church. Right now as we give, we want to give as unto the Lord and ask him to help us. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for the privilege of giving. You said give and it shall be given unto you. And Lord, now we exercise that wonderful opportunity of being able to worship you in giving. Take our gifts, we pray. Let it be multiplied. Let it go in the areas that are pleasing to you. 
We ask in Jesus' lovely and precious holy name, amen. Now, I'd like to give you a testimony real quick. Um, we here have been praying and asking God to help get the orphans out of the Ukraine in the war zone. And we just got this report in. The folks were leaving uh, Germany. They chartered a bus to, to go pick up the children, um, trying to get them from Ukraine and get them into safety. They were told, uh, send them back. They were not going to let them uh, leave the Ukraine. There was two or three other orphanages that were ahead of ours, and all of them got sent back. And uh, the guy, the gentleman that was uh, in charge of this, he, he went in the back of the bus and started praying, started contacting people to pray, and people started praying all over the world. And it, he said, things just changed. And one of the agents said, go ahead, go. And while the children were crossing the border, the other agents were questioning, why are you letting them go? Why are you letting them go? But they, um, uh, the agent just kept letting our kids go. The kids got on the bus, and uh, where they are taking them is about a 15-hour trip from where they were. But our orphan, orphanage children, we have sent money to help rescue them and uh, and thank the Lord, I got the report yesterday that the children are safely out of Ukraine. Thank God for answering prayer and for the other orphanages that were turned back. Let's pray that God would open up doors for them to get out also. And uh, I just wanted to give you a praise report that God is still answering prayer. If you have a prayer request right now, a need, I want to I want to ask you right now if you would to come into agreement with me. If if you have a physical need or a personal need, how about just lay your hand on your chest? Maybe it isn't a need for you, and but you just raise your hand toward heaven that you're standing in the gap for someone else. How about let's pray right now, Father? I want to thank you for answering prayer and helping those orphans to get out of that war zone. I thank you, dear Lord, because you are an on-time God. And I pray for the other orphanages that have not been able to get uh, passage out of the war zone. Touch and help them. Now, dear God, for every person who's laid their hand, uh, who have laid their hands upon their chest, I pray that you would meet their need. Touch them, heal them, deliver them, encourage them. I'm asking also, dear Heavenly Father, for those who have their hand raised for the need of a, another person, that you would intervene and that you would go to where the person is and let the power of the Most High God touch them and help them, I pray in Jesus' lovely and precious holy name. Amen. All right. I'm going to ask you, if you would, turn with me in, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> Acts chapter 5 when the, when the Lord gave me the thought to prepare for tonight, joy, I did not think I would be going to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, if I could put it into how it goes in my mind, it is like riding a roller coaster. Um, there's an up, there's a down, there, uh, there's times to... Uh, look and rejoice, and there's other times like, what in the world is going on? But I, after I read it and studied, I found out, and I believe that you have found this out, if you've lived for the Lord very long, your joy should never be contingent upon your circumstances. Now, it's, it's a lot easier to be joyful when you've got a pocket full of money, it's a lot easier to be joyful when you just, um, you know, married your sweetheart or, or uh, whatever the case may be that would bring natural joy. But uh, what happens when your joy uh, 
is not contingent upon those things. What happens when, when the economy isn't right? Or what happens if you get fired? What happens if your marriage is in trouble? What happens if you do not have a pocket full of money? Do you lose your joy? Now, I will have to tell you that it sounds easier than it is um, to just say, oh, I trust the Lord, glory to God, and he's going to give me the joy. Uh, well, that sounds real good until you're walking in your shoes. But I will have to tell you that there is a place you can get where you have real joy. Your joy is not uh, contingent upon something uh, of earthly value. It, it can be that you have genuine joy in your heart. Now, in the beginning of Acts chapter 5, it, there's a story that talks about Ananias and Sapphira. And so uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they were husband and wife, and, and they got together and, and concocted a scheme that was really a scheme of deception didn't have to happen there was no one twisting their arm but what they did they said we're going to sell a piece of land and we will bring money in but we're going to tell them we sold the land for this much but we're only going to give this much I don't know why they felt like they had to do that um, but they they decided to deceive instead of just being up front. They didn't have to sell the land in the first place. Uh, they didn't have to give a penny of it in the first place. But now they have concocted a negative, conniving scheme. So the Bible tells us that um, Ananias had come in, and Simon Peter confronts him, and he says, Why has Satan... Filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. While it was yours, was it not your own and you had complete control over it? And after it was sold, was it not thine own to do whatever that you wanted to do with it then? But why have you conceived this thing in your heart and you have lied unto men, but you've also lied unto God? Now, Ananias, he was called out right there in, in, in the midst of the leadership of the early New Testament church. And, and so Ananias... Was, was confronted, and after he heard these words, in verse 5, the Bible says, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. In other words, he fell down dead. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Now, you might say, Preacher, gracious, my. Uh, you, you said that you're going to be teaching about joy well I told you also at the beginning that this chapter is a roller coaster uh, a roller coaster of emotion and so uh, young men came and, and they took up the body of Ananias and they took him out and they buried him and about three hours later his wife came and she didn't know what had had happened she was a part of the scheme, but she didn't know her husband had dropped dead. She didn't know that they had taken him out and buried him. And Simon Peter answered unto her, Tell me, did you sell the land for this amount of money? And she said, Yes, for that much. She was a party to the sin. 
Then Simon Peter gave, uh, said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them that have taken your husband out to bury him is at the door, and they're going to carry you out also. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and died. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. Now, uh, well, what a rough way to start a Wednesday night service, huh? Well, I want you to get this picture. These folks had concocted a lie. Now, I just want to tell you, if you want joy in your life, be truthful but most of all, be truthful to God. How ridiculous is it to think that you could lie to Almighty God? How preposterous could it be that you would think that you could pull one over on God? When, when I became truly joyous and happy in my spirit, I wish someone would have told me this when I was a younger Christian, but when, when I truly became joyous and happy in my spirit is when I started accepting my own fault and not blaming other people. Now, see, Adam and Eve, they were very good at blaming other people. When Adam was confronted about eating the fruit, he said, it was a woman you gave me. If you wouldn't have given me that woman, I wouldn't have done what I did. When the, and the woman said, well, it was that serpent. You put a serpent in the garden, and that serpent deceived me. And instead of owning up to, you know, it's me. I need help. Ananias and Sapphira had agreed to try to lie to the Holy Ghost, but that didn't work. Now, now let's get into the joy part. Now, when the New Testament church which was in its infancy because just over in Acts chapter 2 is when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out and the church was in a revival and, and great joy came that day and 3,000 people were added to the church. Well, now the church is in the midst of a revival, but Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they were, by their sin, was throwing uh, water on the fire. They were, they were putting a wet blanket on, on the revival that was there. And the Bible tells us in verse 11, And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands, now listen at this, and by the hands of the apostles, many Signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So all of a sudden, from a negative, uh, God started moving and saying, I'm not going to let a couple of negative people, uh, I'm not going to let a couple of liars uh, throw water on the fire. I'm not going to let them douse out the flame that has started. And so signs and wonders started manifesting. And, and the people were seeing this happen. It, it, became, uh, it became a mighty move of God right there, the power of God moving. Verse 13, it says, And the rest uh, did no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were added, were more added to the church, to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. So the, the, after this happened with Ananias and Sapphira, instead of it being a negative, God turned it to a positive with signs and wonders following the believers. And listen, verse 15. Now this is where it starts getting pretty exciting here. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow 
of Simon Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And then, uh, I just want you to get this picture. Faith was building so much. They were seeing the New Testament. And, and let, me, let me just throw this to you. There are those who say miracles were there in Jesus' time. And, uh, and, and miracles were done when Jesus was here. But Jesus was now dead, resurrected from the dead, and at the right hand of the Father. And you see miracles taking place here among the apostles and the believers. And there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem. Listen to this. Bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Now, if you don't think that would bring joy, you just had a funeral or two funerals, but now all of a sudden there's a breakout of miracles. Uh, every person that came with a need, every person that came that needed to be delivered from a devil if they were sick, every one of them was healed. My goodness, I am sure the talk about Jesus was at a height right there. Then the high priest rose up, uh-oh, the religious people, the people who say, that can't be real. Uh, you're not doing it the way we thought it ought to be done. We, we, you're not doing it the way that it's always been done. And uh, and, and, you know, you, you, if you were really wanting to argue, and you don't, but you would like to have said to the high priest and, and to the leadership, where are your miracles? Uh, where are people getting healed and delivered from demon possession under your ministry? You, you can attack this one, but you're not producing fruit. And I think that it's important to understand that as the high priest came uh, and the Sadducees, and again, I've said this many, many times, but the Sadducees was a religious sect that did not believe in the resurrection. And when I was in college, they told us to remember it. They were sad, you see, because they did not believe in the resurrection. And, uh, and so the, these religious people they were filled, the Bible says, with indignation. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in common prison. Uh, you're not going to preach and you're not going to heal. I, it is so ridiculous when you read this story from a natural perspective. These folks who are supposed to be religious leaders... They come in and they say, I'm going to tell you, we want you to quit healing people. We want you to quit delivering people who are demon-possessed. So stop it. And they went so far as to put them into prison. And so here they are in prison. But verse 19, it says, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison door or the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple in the, um, to the people all the words of life. And, and uh, so at night, these folks were released from prison and, and brought out. The next morning, the next morning, they went out telling people, about Jesus. Now, if that would have been some people, uh, once they got out of that jail, they would have gone. They would have said, we're, we're done. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going back to prison. I, I'll, I'll go do ministry somewhere else. But what happened is they actually went out and they began to tell the people and, and they went and stood in the temple and they told the people all the words of life. And verse 21, and when they heard that, 
they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Well, uh, they, they went to the prison, and when they got to the prison, they found the prison keeper standing outside the door like he was supposed to be. They opened up the doors, but they found nobody inside the prison. Why? Because the angel of the Lord had freed them. Now, the Bible says, whom, the Lord, uh, whom God has set free is free indeed. We can, you can be in a prison in your mind, you can be in a prison even physically, but there is a way. There is a way for God to get you through it and get you out of it. So they go into the temple, they get these apostles, and they, they ask them a question in verse 28. Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And in verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. You're trying to tell us to be quiet, but we can't be quiet. As one in the Bible said, it's like, Fire shut up in my bones. I tried to be quiet, but I couldn't do it. I hope you get on fire so much that you'll be like Peter and the rest of the apostles that you say, we can't help but tell it. We have to tell people about the power of God. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree is what Simon Peter told them. He went ahead and put the blame on them and let them know you crucified our Savior, but he's not dead. He's alive. He's not dead. He's still powerful. He's not dead. He's still performing miracles. He's not dead. He's still delivering people from demon possession. Hear what I am saying. I am here today declaring the same message that Simon Peter uh, delivered, and I want you to hear it and hear it well. Jesus is not dead. Uh, he is alive. He's still in the miracle business. He's still in the delivering business. Would you receive it right now? Would you accept it right now? Would you open up your heart right now and say, I receive the risen Savior and all the power that he has. I accept it in my life uh, it, just as you did back in Acts chapter 5. I believe you can do it today. In 2022, you are a healer, you are a deliverer. So these folks now have heard this message. Simon Peter is really pouring it on to them and letting them know you're the ones that are guilty, you're the ones that have uh, done wrong, but we're going to proclaim this message. And they, they are now really wanting to kill them, not just put them in prison, but kill them. And there was one of the council, a man by the name of Gamaliel, and, and, and he spoke up and he gave some wisdom to them. And he said, if this is of God, we ought not to fight against it. And, and if it's not of God, it'll just fizzle out. So I, I want you to hear that again. If it's of God, we ought not to fight against it. And if it's not of God, it will just fizzle out. Well, I just want to tell you, as a preacher of the gospel in the year 2022, I want you to understand that, the, that Jesus is alive and his message has not fizzled out. I want to tell you that the power of the Holy Ghost is still real. The Holy Ghost still fills people and empowers people. The gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the operations of the Spirit are still 
prevalent today if you'll believe. And Jesus Christ is not dead. God is not, uh, has not lost one bit of his power. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are still working. And I just want to tell you, this has not fizzled out. In fact, if anything more, I believe the Bible says when sin doth abound, the grace of God does much more abound. I believe we're living in one of the greatest days that there's ever been on the planet Earth. We're living in an anointed time. And instead of us tucking tail and running, instead of us being fearful and saying we don't know what to do, I wish somebody would say, I embrace the moment. And even like Simon Peter, I'm going to tell the message of Jesus Christ. I'm going to proclaim that he is still the healer. He is still the miracle worker. And so in verse 39, uh, verse 38, it says uh, that they tell, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will be to naught. In other words, it will fizzle out. Verse 39, but if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. Now look at verse 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. They brought them in, beat them, and told them, we better not hear you preaching about Jesus anymore. Verse 41 says, and they departed, talking about the apostles, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now, you would have thought that the beaten would have caused them to have a total different outlook. In other words, after they were beaten, they said, hey, thank God we were counted worthy to bear a little bit of shame for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you willing to share and bear a little bit of shame so that his name can be magnified. In verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. When you get enough joy in your heart, when you get the joy of the Lord in your heart, the world is going to try to get you to be quiet. The world is going to try to get your message to be quiet. But I'm here today to tell you, the world didn't give us our joy, and the world can't take it away. Beatings cannot take your joy away. Uh, persecution cannot take your joy away. Circumstances, if you've got real joy, circumstances cannot take your joy away. So what kind of joy is that? It's the joy of the Lord. And the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's our strength. These apostles did not do that in natural strength. These apostles did what they did in the strength and the power of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Right now, you might be going through the worst time of your life and... and you may be thinking, how in the world am I going to get through all this? Oftentimes, when people get to that point, they try to fi find a way to escape. It might be with pills. It might be with taking a gun and ending your life, hanging yourself. Any number of ways to try to escape. But I'm, I, I want to tell you, you don't have to escape because God can give you the same joy in the midst of your problem that he did for the apostles. After they were beaten, they rejoiced 
that they were counted worthy to suffer persecution. Now, here's the thing. Oftentimes, we look at these years that we have on earth, and that's what we focus in on. We focus in on the 70, 80, 90 years. Some are blessed with 100. We focus in on those years. But when you compare that to eternity, thousands and millions of years from now, we will be here. We will be somewhere because, listen to me, we are eternal beings. And we focus in on the natural instead of the spiritual. God has a great place prepared for those who will just put their trust totally in him and he will give you joy. And the, as a songwriter put it, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. Alcohol can't give you joy. That will last. Uh, drugs can't give you joy. That will last. But there is a place to be found in the Lord where you can find joy and find real joy in Jesus Christ. Father God, if there's anyone here today that does not know you as their personal Savior, anyone listening by any means, maybe they're feeling beat down, they feel like that there's no hope, there's no help for their situation, would you let them understand that even as you helped and reached out to the apostles and gave them joy even after they were beaten, even after they were imprisoned. You can give joy to that individual who is experiencing that here on earth. Maybe they are imprisoned in their mind. They're imprisoned in their emotions. Maybe they are imprisoned in, maybe they're watching this and they literally are imprisoned. But I pray, dear God, that the prison bars, no matter what form they take, will not keep them from having the joy unspeakable and full of glory that comes from you. Now, dear Lord, the way that they receive joy is to accept you fully, serve you regardless of circumstances. Now, dear Lord, I pray that you would give joy, and as you give joy, let that joy be full in Jesus' lovely and precious holy name. Amen and amen. Well, I want to encourage you to be here on Sunday morning, and uh, I'd like for us to conclude with our scripture that says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 9 or 11 or both. God bless you, and we will be praying for you.